Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference with Paul Omarod. Paul is the author of Death of Economics, Why Most Things Fail, Positive Linking and a number of other books. Uh, Paul, thank you for joining us today. Okay. Uh, Paul, I think uh, you wrote The Death of Economics some time ago, I think it was 1994, and you argued that there's something wrong with conventional economics. And uh, the current financial crisis seems to suggest you might have been right about that. Um, what is wrong with conventional economics? Well, you're right. I mean, it's actually, I mean, it came out in 94, but it's, I actually remember starting work on it almost 20 years to this day. Um, well, I mean, the problem, it seems to me, is that it, it's very, well, there are two things, two things, um, both of which the financial crisis reflects. Uh, one of which is, in the theory, it's very much based on the theory that the economy, left to itself, will go back to some sort of equilibrium. That's its natural tendency. And this means, for example, that you know, unemployment will tend to be low. Um, because you know, supply and demand for labour will balance. So there'll be a natural tendency to have full employment. Uh, economies you know, got back to equilibrium. And that struck me at the time, you know, was simply you know, empirically wrong. Um, and secondly, uh, which the financial crisis has shown again, is it's very much based, and this, this is where my thinking has developed over the years, it's very much based on the idea that people act in isolation. You know, that we're essentially Robinson Crusoe's. We've got our views, we form our views, and we pay no regard to what other people are doing. Now, I mean, economists listening will say, well, yes, we can allow for these things, and of course, uh, but in, in the, 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 the main thrust of economic theory is to think people operate in isolation, not in society, that they don't copy and follow what other people do. Whereas the financial crisis shows that. Um, operating, I mean, really, really powerfully. That one sentiment change, um, we had a dramatic recession. And the current time, I know we're going to get on to talking about this later, uh, until sentiment becomes more positive um, amongst companies, amongst people, um, it's going to be hard to get out of the current one. And this is the way in which things spread amongst individuals. So it struck me that although it's not an empty box, it nevertheless had a big particularly flawed view of how the world um, operates. So, um, of course, of course that, that had been, you know, there was a lot of, that, I mean, the criticism of the um, excesses, if you like, of the financial sector in terms of rewards, um, although, the, you know, in the last 10 years, they, these have become out of all proportion to come, uh, what they were before, but these have been around a long time. You know, people in the financial sector um, were always paid very substantial more, even though, I remember you know, writing this in the first chapter, you know, there was immense competition for these jobs. You know, say in America, you know, many of the best graduates from Harvard and Yale and Princeton wanted to work on Wall Street, and yet despite this enormous oversupply, the price didn't fall. The wages went up and up and up and up, which seemed to be in direct contradiction to the way the theory operates. Mm -hmm. um... Obviously, if you think there are limits to conventional economics, you'll have some ideas about how we can fix some of those. And we'll, we'll come back to that at the, to, later in the conversation. We'll talk about some, some ideas for getting out of the crisis that we, we find ourselves in. Um, you, you also read a book called Why Do Most Things Fail? Um, and that perhaps links into the failure of almost everyone to, to predict the crisis. And... Uh, um, why do most things fail? Where is the problem? What's wrong with our thinking as a species? Well, I think, I mean, just, 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 just specifically on the crisis, I think, um, you know, conventional economics can be blamed for an awful lot. Uh, and so, for example, um, I think three weeks before Lehman Brothers failed, which, of course, precipitated a major crisis, the, um, the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund uh, wrote, a, wrote a paper out in which he said the state of macroeconomics is good. You know, they really thought they had fixed the crisis. They, they, they thought they'd solved the central problem of recessions once and for all with their new equilibrium theories. So that's not excusing them in terms of understanding. I think, to be fair, um, prediction is exceptionally hard. 
Um, and I think it's, it's not really fair to accuse people of you know, failing to um, predict. I think you, they can certainly be accused of being far too complacent and simply not even allowing for the possibility of a recession, you know, which I think is, was a very serious error. Um, but the precise prediction of, of economic events is a, uh, you know, a fundamentally exceptionally difficult problem. Um, you know, the precise thing in which catalyzes it, like failure of Lehman's, nobody would reasonably predict, um, predict that. Well, I think um, it doesn't mean that we can't um, uh, do things, um, but I think one of the things about why most things fail, I've, I've been very much drawn for inspiration, looking at ideas in biology and evolution, uh, which seems to be a much a more powerful way of understanding the human world than um, if like the equilibrium concept in economics. And the thing is, in, in the failure arises because the environment in which we operate, um, you know, everyday environment, take a company, who it competes with, you know, um, what sort of things it sells, um, how, how the general economic environment evolves. These things operate. These things evolve too quickly. It's too complex mm -hmm. um, for people to grasp in its entirety. Is that what and you, so you, at you some saw? point you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Even very big companies, you know, uh, make big mistakes because the world is very complex and too hard to understand. Is that the idea of a, a bounded rationality that they that we, we're just not able to grasp the full complexity of the system? Well, yes, yes. I mean, in a sense, I mean, to, I mean, to slightly caricature it, I mean, free market economics is very similar intellectually to a completely central planned economy. We think, you know, you've got the intellectual power to understand how everything works. And that's simply not true. The world's a very sort of messy and complex place. I mean, it doesn't mean that policy is useless or government hasn't got a role. Um, it's just that we have to be, you know, a bit more humble about what we think we're going to be able to achieve. And to say, like the uh, the free market theory said, the equilibrium theory said, that the central problem of economic de depression is one which has been solved, mm -hmm. uh, seems to me to be you know co completely false. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, we, we we will have de depressions, and the question is, how can we design our structures to make our systems resilient so we bounce out of them? How can we design systems so that the impact on people is not as dramatic as it might be. You know, how can we actually design resilience in our systems rather than trying to predict and control uh, and avoid them, which is a, a fundamentally difficult problem. Mm -hmm. the, the economist Ha Jun Chang, I think, speaks at some length about bounded rationality and his argue, argument to me sounds similar to yours, that the system is so complex, therefore we need to make it simpler, even if we're limiting ourselves uh, by things which um, business might call red tape or, or, or we need to create boundaries. Do you agree with that? What are your policy suggestions well, I think, I think about that? I think one of the problems is, I mean, um, I think it's very dangerous to say, you know, we have this theory and therefore we must um, you mm -hmm. know, design the world to be like the theory. And that's something which, which mainstream economics does um, in a very serious way. They say this is how the world ought to operate uh, and therefore if it doesn't, it's the world's fault and we'll try and design it. And an awful lot of, for example, um, in, in regulated industries like water, telecoms, power and so forth, uh, an awful lot of the regulatory system um, is designed with that view in mind to try and make the world more like economists think it ought to be rather than coping with um, how it actually is. So yes, I mean the way people um, behave for most of the time isn't um, as a lot of you know, rational calculating machines um, te you know, performing, taking the best possible decision. They use they use rules of thumb, mm -hmm. um, you know, to guide them through very complex decisions, you know, and continue to use them um, until you know until they, they don't work, and then then evolve and, and try something else. Um, this seems to be you know a very good strategy to follow um, in in very complex systems like you know, human and and, 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 and and the social worlds. I mean, it doesn't mean that economics is completely wrong. I think, you know, things like incentives clearly do matter. You know, if you change uh, prices, if you put a tax on something, if you give people a subsidy, you know, people do alter their behaviour in response to that. But often in very complex ways which, uh, uh, you know, defeat the central planner. Mm -hmm. um, 
your your most recent book is called Positive Linking, and it speaks about the the power of networks. And it sounds to me that you're hinting at some of that in what you're saying now. That that, that there are other things at work which um, escape central planners, whether they're of the free market or the the, the, the sort of state controlled variety. Can you explain what you mean about the the power of network well, thinking? Yes, I, think, I think increasingly, like I said, the fundamental point about the fundamental thing, which in my view, which is wrong with mainstream economics, is its assumption that people or decision makers, whether it's a person, a firm, or whatever, is operating in isolation. Whereas increasingly, um, I think it's always been the case to some extent, but increasingly the world's becoming more interconnected, we're much more aware of what other people do or think or behave, and increasingly, for to use a shorthand phrase, and I'm using this in shorthand, uh, people increasingly just simply copy. It's a very complex world, so we copy. So for example, you know, when I bought my iPhone, this is some time ago, my smartphone, how did I decide? Well, you know, I've no idea how these things work. I've no idea about the technicalities. Now, I could, you know, invest a huge amount of time trying to find out. Uh, but I went into the office, asked a few young people and said, which, ones, which one have you got? Uh, is it any good? And they all said yes, so I got the same. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just a way of, uh, if, like, of, 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 of coping with complexity. So increasingly... Um, you know, we're actually connected, and this is what a network is. I mean, who, are, who, who do I pay attention to when I'm making decisions? And that network will vary depending on the decision I'm taking. Now, increasingly and very pleasingly, um, institutions like the Bank of England and the European Central Bank are looking at networks between financial institutions, because one of the problems was the, fact that the, 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 the idea that the economy uh, has a network structure, and that's fundamental, uh, was very important to the financial crisis um, because it wasn't just one bank going under. You know, the effects of one bank going bankrupt ha- would have a knock-on effect throughout the system. And that's why there was no repetition of the experiment, uh, which it was an experiment, um, of letting Lehman Brothers go bankrupt. Um, because if others, that's why so much effort was involved in propping the banks up. And that was one of the things we've learned um, in contrast to the 1930s, the last Great Depression, um, is to, you know, the, the, whatever the cost, even though the bankers themselves may be very culpable, the banks as institutions, we couldn't let whole streams fail in this network way. I mean, a t- you know, cascading across the network, otherwise we'd have had you know, massive failures all around. So that was a very network system. And like I say, institutions like the Bank of England and uh, European Central Bank are increasingly looking at the financial system as a network one. Mm-hmm. Now, who's connected to who? What are the liabilities and assets? Uh, and getting a better idea um, of how shocks might spread across the system. A better idea of how you put in effective fire breaks mm-hmm. to this sort of thing. Um, and that's right at the forefront of economic policy. So I think things are moving in, in a very positive way in that respect. But just stepping back from that and thinking, uh, let's think about you know, um, it's like personal behaviour. Because increasingly, you know, one of the problems in, in the West, if you like, the, the problems of affluence, you know, things like uh, obesity, or certainly in the UK, you know, binge drinking, um, which is, uh, well, British, British people will be very familiar with this, when young people go out and drink you know, stupendous amounts of alcohol, like start off with a litre of vodka or something, to start the evening off. Um, now... Obviously, these you know, obesity and things like this are a matter of you know, profound social concern. Um, but essentially, now, how do these things become acceptable? It's not that people are deliberately copying. You know, they see somebody in a gutter completely paralytic and say, that's a good thing to copy, I'll do that. Or you see somebody who's very fat and immediately you go out and eat ten pizzas <laughs> because you want to be fat. Now, that's that, that, I mean, copying is a shorthand word. And what you're doing there, this is much more about peer acceptance. You know, what sort of behaviour um, is regarded as being reasonable by your peers. Now, it's not that long ago, uh, 20 or 30 years. Well, yeah, I mean, young, young men have always drunk, you know, lots occasionally. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, acceptable to be repeatedly, you know, completely paralytic and tend to hospital or, you know, whatever. Um, it wasn't acceptable. Um, for people to be, you know, grossly obese, and these are spread across social networks. Like it gives a signal that it's okay to do that. Now, the challenge for policy is how do we break into these networks? How do we give counterexamples? 
how do we get, if you like, um, the, the cascade of behavior to go backwards? Instead of spreading and it becoming acceptable, how do we take it back? Now, just, just if I can just give another example, uh, thinking about um, bankers' bonuses, um, you know, which has obviously been a massive, massive problem. No, just, I mean, it, and this is not a frivolous suggestion I've made, but it's been taken up by a number of people who rather think it's rather amusing. I've said, well, look, how do we signal to bankers that it's not acceptable to behave in this way? So my view, certainly in the UK, is you simply say what the government should do is to say, right, we won't put any of you in the House of Lords, we won't give any of you a knighthood, and we won't even ask you, we won't even let the Queen ask you to uh, garden parties at Buckingham Palace. We'll just signal our social disapproval of this sort of behaviour. Now, there's no guarantee that they'll pay attention to that, but they might. And it might actually coalesce um, and people realise it's not acceptable behaviour. So you've got to give signals, if you like, which might seem quite indirect. And it's quite subtle to try to how we do this. Um, it's not just simply pulling a lever and getting a given effect, like a, like a machine. It's much more like a, like a biological system. How we prod it here, we prod it there, how we're going to get it to move. And you've got to try a variety of things, some of which might be quite indirect. But if you get it to work, then it'll be extremely successful. That sounds very challenging for, uh, for, for policy makers, for people in, in government, for people who work within institutions, because the model has always been, um, you know, the pull the lever and get a, get a product result. Um, and what you're describing is, is actually a different way of interacting with, with public politics and with, with economics. And how, how do we bring about that kind of culture change? Well, I agree. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is a fundamental problem because that you're right. They've been raised in the view of mainstream economics, which is, you know, it's incredibly powerful in uh, the design and practice of public policy. Um, not just in financial institutions, everywhere. Um, it sits there. Um, it's a very powerful and attractive because it gives the illusion, like I said, if the world operates like a machine, um, if we can press this button, we get that result. We pull this lever, we get the other result. Um, and economists themselves encourage this view. Uh, and it's a very seductive one, even though it may not be true at all. Um, it's very seductive for policymakers. Rather than saying, well, look, the world's very complex. We might try this, and that might work. Try this, that might work. It's not, but that's how the world is. It's not a criticism of this approach. That is fundamentally how the world is. See, if I could just step back a minute. Um, if we look, this, if we step back to the, after, just after the Second World War in the early 1950s, um, when, when it's like the foundations of uh, the economy and, and uh, social policy throughout the West were founded then, um, the idea, because certainly compared to before the Second World War, uh, the state takes a much, much more active role in the economy and society than it ever did, and very considerably more. And yet problems remain. It's not a problem that the state's not, not, not inefficient. I mean, it shows how hard it is using these, um, this sort of um, machine-like view to solve problems. Because take set unemployment. Um, if we actually look at the averages, of unemployment in the major Western economies, or the range even, um, from the uh, from since the Second World War to now, and compare it to the previous sixty years, um, apart, I mean, actually the averages are very similar. They're very similar, um, and the idea that you know, I mean, state intervention has, has actually led to lower unemployment on average, you know, simply isn't true. Um, it's you know that say it went a, 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 for, before the Second World War, very little state intervention. Average unemployment over a long period of time is very similar. Um, the, in the 1930s, in some countries, it was higher. The maximum was higher, but in general, um, the average has been very similar. So it, we've got to have a completely different way of thinking about how we approach policy. Uh, and I think this is this is a, a potential way of, of solving problems. Um, so, uh, my next question was going to be, let's, let's get into solving some of the problems. Um, and that's, it's going to be an interesting question for you to answer because uh, you, you're saying you can't, you can't really solve them with levers. You need, you need, you need to change thinking. 
um, and, and, and that's challenging. Um, the problem we face, of course, is you know the debt crisis in Europe. We have an economy in the UK that's uh, stumbling around a sort of triple dip uh, recession. It's not. It's not really growing. Um, it's also not completely disastrous. It's just. Uh, it's in the doldrums. It's just not really performing. Um, there are contradictory policy ideas all over the place. Nothing appears to really be working. Uh, what on earth do we do to to save the UK economy, to to, to save the, the European economy, and uh, think more accurately about economics and the, the problems that we face? How do how do we diagnose the problems correctly and, and begin to solve them? Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult problem, and I think it's a big mistake um, uh, of pe which people who are critical of mainstream economics, it's a trap which is easy to fall into, to think that there is you know, a, a, an easy formula for getting out of the problem. Um, so take, for example, the current state of the UK. You know, should we have more fiscal expansion? Should there be more public expenditure? Now, um, there's a case, but it, it depends what it is, but let's just take it in general first of all. Now, there's a case to be made for it. If, if, if the government can, as you know, I mean, it, I mean interest rates in Britain um, are very low, around 2% on, on government debt compared to say they've been 7 or 8 in Spain or Italy. Now, if the British government can carry out um, a fiscal expansion and, and, and move away from austerity and interest rates stay low, then yes, you know, that policy would probably be successful. But you know, if it actually expands and interest rates go to seven or eight percent, that is a complete disaster. Because you know, not only are interest rates suddenly very high, uh, but people's wealth is reduced dramatically um, by, uh, by the fall in, uh, in, in the value of government bonds. Now this seems to me a judgment, it's a question of how, how a market is going to react, it's what's the sentiment going to be. Um, it's not something that we can actually you know, predict precisely, it's a question of judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's that? And it seems to me a lot of the debate that the left are engaging in, they're not recognising the, the need to form a judgment as to how this will be received and how it might, this sentiment might spread um, across uh, the markets. Now coming on to the network effect on, on on what's required because there's a big difference between the recession of the 1930s and the current one um, and the big difference is not just here but in America um, in that the corporate sector firms have reacted much more swiftly this time round than they did in the last financial global financial crisis uh, this is corporate this is non-financial firms and they've rebuilt their balance sheets uh, and they're sitting on large piles of cash they're sitting there and they don't know what to do with it. Now this is why it's a network effect. You're sitting there a big company, you've got you know, several hundred million or maybe several billion you're sitting on. You've postponed your investment projects for some years uh, because you're uncertain about the outlook. And as soon as other people start to spend, you will spend. It will give you the confidence to do it. But until other people do, you won't. And the problem is that other people who form part of this network are looking at you uh -huh. and think, well, if he starts to spend or she starts to spend, I will. And this is why it's a network problem. I do think if we can somehow unlock these corporate surpluses uh -huh. which are sitting there, um, then we will get, as we did in the 30s, something of an investment boom and we will start to move back very strongly um, towards full employment because we'll get investment, people will be hired. You know, and, and the economy will generally take off. Now, how we trigger that sentiment is not a conventional instrument of policy. Mm -hmm. How do we actually get them to do it? Um, and it's really something which I think just um, emerges. I think there are some good signs. It, it, you know, the news is becoming more positive. Uh, there are some good signs and people may begin to um, relax. But we should think of the narrative. We manage the the dominant. How do we try and get stories to, to spread across the relevant networks? Um, how can we use modern technology to think about that? It's a completely different way of thinking about policy um, than you know, the, the conventional one. Um, and if we did that, then you know uh, we it would have a very very powerful. Um, bus. So maybe just again the UK context. You know maybe um, there's a case for saying we should. Uh, be spending on big infrastructure projects, uh -huh. you know, much more because that, that, that would be you know, corporates can't participate in that. 
and there's a good case for saying, well, you know, these will ultimately pay back. Um, so it's not as though we're adding to long-term debt. So there might be a, a case for doing that, not just in its own way, but as acting as a signal to try and change sentiment on, on corporate networks. And that's what we've got to think of. How do we actually uh, manage to uh, manage, manage to achieve that? Because the, the potential is there to end the recession uh, and to move forward. How do we unlock it? It's a difficult problem. So, so, so you're saying that the, the, the state could potentially send that signal but it has to be careful to send the right signal. Um, it can't just invest in, 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 in something at random and hope that um, companies will, will unlock all their cash reserves and invest in the same thing because the state has sent that signal. It has to judge quite carefully what, what, it, what it invests in. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, so I, mean, I think, um, I think, well, this comes back to the point about, you know, how, how, how would the markets react to an increase in public spending? Um, you know, it might, it might, it might very. I mean, there's no way of guaranteeing in advance what how they will react. But it makes it makes a big difference whether the interest rates stay at two or even three percent, or go to seven or eight, like has happened in Spain or Greece, where it seems to me they are trapped in a in a debt spiral, which is very hard to escape from. Uh, so that so there are, there are real risks. Of that. So you think very carefully um, about precisely what the impact might be. And like I say, I think it's too. I mean, I think it's too glib of you know many people on the left who just advocate an end to austerity without giving a much more careful thought of to the potential downsides. There are there are huge upsides and the state has a crucial role to play. You know, the state does, you know, after all set many of the rules, spends a huge amount of money. Um, how do we send that signal without uh, how do we get a positive signal rather than a negative one? It's mm -hmm. a difficult judgment. I do think there's now a case for announcing you know, many more um, you know, big infrastructure projects where you know, Britain certainly lacks. Uh, my it's just a judgment. I think we could get away with that. Mm -hmm. If we said, um, I'm just making this up an example, you know, we're going to take on 10,000 more civil servants and employ them in Liverpool or whatever, um, people might think, well, you know, that's not going to do anything. Um, and that's a bad thing. And it'll actually deter people from spending. So I think you've got to think about how, how it's going to be received, mm -hmm. not just by the markets which people are obsessed with, mm -hmm. but by other companies. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be seen as a positive signal or as a negative one? So, so what I'm understanding from you is that um, because economics is so much more complex than we often give it uh, credit for, it's not up to the state to just sit there with its levers and pull, pull things and make things happen. But the state does have levers. However, oh, we I need to see those yeah. levers as, as triggers rather than as, a, as, as simple mechanisms. And you're, oh, not, yes. you're never entirely sure what that trigger is going to result in. And so it needs to be managed quite carefully. Um, can you be more specific on what you think some of those levers are and, and what the triggers might be? In other words, given that we do have a state that does have power and can spend, what can it do? What should it be doing? What kind of infrastructure should we be investing in? What sort of signals should we be sending? Right. I mean, it's not an argument. I'm not making an argument for no government. I'm thinking, you know, governments need to be try and think a lot, lot smarter. Um, well, let me just give 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 one example. This is another example of um, potentially, you know, indirect approaches. Now, quite not unreasonably, one of the things I'm not talking about the financial sector now, but in, in the in the non-financial corporates, um, I mean, people that the senior executives are perfectly reasonably, you know, interested in what they themselves get paid, and an awful in an awful lot of companies, for example, um, their bodies are tied to or in some way linked to the share price of the company. No, it's not the only way, but that would be a part of their bonus package. Now. If you're sitting on a pile of cash, one thing you might do with it is to start buying back company shares, because that will actually help the share price. So it will actually help your own bonus. Mm -hmm. And there's an incentive for you to do that rather than actually carry out, uh, you know, a big spending project, you know, which might go wrong. Um, so one thing you might want to do is to think about legislation about you know, um, compensation packages for executives. You know, it wouldn't necessarily trigger it immediately, but thinking about how planning ahead, how do we make the system more resilient, to say, well, we want to either legislate or nudge it away from, you know, that sort of behaviour where if you're, if you're 
uh, they said exactly at the moment there is, apart from the general economic uncertainty, they, they themselves, many of them, have incentives not to spend on investment projects, um, you know, rather than buy back shares, which you've seen going on, which helps their own bonuses. So that's one thing. So you're going to think that maybe something along those lines um, might actually send a signal. Um, so that, that's an example where you've just got to think around things and try it out um, and see. Um, uh, but in general, I mean, thinking about the arguments on, um, you know, in, in the, the, say the London airport, I mean, it seems to me, um, I mean, it's so obvious that if you look at what's going on in the rest of the world, I mean, it's so obvious that, you know, um, that successful economies have to have airport capacity. So it doesn't really matter where it's built. Um, but you've got to sort of excel, I mean, I think if a, a decision to you know, accelerate the planning structure and just start building it, in itself will send a signal. But let me, actually, let me give you another example, although this was unintended, thinking about London's image, where you know, there are all sorts of standard calculations about the Olympics, you know, how many jobs they create, what the legacy will be, and so on, right? Just orthodox, and that it's not that it's wrong, but what's been the real impacts of the Olympics in London? I mean, it's conveyed a completely different picture of Britain to the rest of the world. I mean, it's presented us, in, you know, Instead of which, rest of all, may see us as a caricature going back to the 1950s or something, but it's portrayed you know, a vibrant and a modern, you know, a sort of multiracial, uh, you know, uh, country, uh, you know, it, which has got, which has just transformed the picture of Britain, makes it a much more attractive place mm -hmm. for the rest of the world, um, and that, in a sense, that wasn't intended, but that seems to me that's been you know, a tremendous. Um, you know, it's like side effects of holding the Olympics, mm -hmm. um, which can only do as good. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's things like that, um, which are hard to pin down, mm -hmm. um, but it just requires, you know, so people should think, I me, mean, what I suppose I'm saying really is that policymakers should think of themselves more as being, if you like, as in, in marketing and advertising mm -hmm. uh, than in planning departments, and that, mm -hmm. that would help their, help their thinking. What about... Um Manufacturing, because uh, we're from a, a trade union organization, and, and as unions, we are very keen on uh, job creation. We'd like there to be more jobs in the economy, and we'd like them to be highly skilled jobs. And the UK had a large and proud manufacturing sector in the past. Um, it doesn't have to the same extent anymore, um, yet Germany manages to still have that. And uh, we would like to see a bigger manufacturing sector. What what can be done about that? What how how can we how can we support our manufacturing sector and uh, and and is it possible or desirable to shift from services back towards manufacturing to some extent? Well, I think I think there are there there are two points. I think um, well there, there are benefits. I mean, America, although um, um, its manufacturing sector as part of a as economy is small. Um, as, as, as you will realise, has got you know, a very, very high tech manufacturing sector, uh, and it's actually reclaiming some jobs. I think now from from the developing world, um, moving back there. So there are some good arguments. Um, let me just give an example. Uh, this is something I'm interested in in developing. And uh, this this is this is for the regions. Right? How do we actually get? Because obviously I'm, I'm originally myself from Lancashire, um, which is become as parts of it have become very depressed. How do we revive these areas where manufacturing was concentrated? Now what they, what these what these um, um, areas need above all is exports, not necessarily exports um, out of the UK, though that would be good, but you know, exports to people you know, they want to produce things, goods and services to say people in the London and the South East want. Mm. And that would that would help these people. We know that, you know, trade, um, this is one of the one of the best insights of economics, in general, trade is beneficial. We can make some qualification that, but in general, it's not a zero-sum game, it benefits both parties. Now, one of the problems they have is that, you know, it's simply, you know, a lack of networks. You know, who do they sell to? Can we provide them with information? Can you go along to a company and say, let's say, a, a small or medium-sized manufacturing firm in, let's say, you know, Darlington or somewhere, or Burnley, and so, look, you're doing this sort of business with these sort of people. Um, let's find out. You know, who is who? Are, you know, are these are your best customers. 
know, let's just use, um, it's, and it's simple to do, let's just use information technology to find out, you know, which companies are, ve- are more similar to the ones that you're already selling to. Here are your best marketing leads. How can we strengthen, um, you know, almost like a recommender system where we, we, we all use on Amazon and things like that. There are many ways for strengthening these things. Just strengthen the network of information flow. Um, because what, what we need is not good sectors, we need good companies. That, that's where, I mean, the sector is just a, um, it's just a statistical artifact, an industrial sector. What we want are, are good companies, co- companies that make things that other people outside their areas want, whether it's outside the UK or within outside a depressed region. So, I mean, there's a thing, uh, an idea for sort of trying to use networks to help people to find out, you know, more about who they can sell to. Um, so, yes, and I think, you know, the, the, that, 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 that's a, a sort of a, a different way of doing it. I don't, I don't think, again, there isn't a simple way of saying how do we revive uh, manufacturing. One way we might do it is, um, you know, there have been all sorts of things tried, so I'm, I'm, I'm rather sceptical about these things. No, it's just giving tax breaks, but they're very careful and they're always open to, uh, very hard to design, sorry, uh, uh, and they're always open to, you know, to manipulation. Uh, we've tried that. But I guess stepping aside on this, let's think about how do we send the right signals. Well, the fact is, one of the, many of the most able um, graduates in the country for a number of years have been attracted into the finance industry. Now, because simply because you make a lot more money. Uh, there, you know, it's a, from an individual point of view, it's actually very sensible, uh, rather than working in other sectors of the economy. Uh, how do we you know, steer people away? Should we should that that's that's what we should be thinking about. It's not just a matter of money. It's a question of you know the overall incentives, how they're regarded. Um, I did think for a brief period, and and certainly it did happen for a very brief period, um, that uh, some of the top graduates moved, you know, didn't want to go in the city. But I think that's now changing, and people are now wanting to go, go in it again, because you can still make a lot of money. Um, how do we actually get the signal sent that, no, why don't you go into manufacturing? And, you know, you can make a lot of money doing that, and you can do interesting things. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, I, I'm not saying that conventional measures shouldn't be tried. I'm not, I'm not dismissing them. I'm just thinking again, how do we think more imaginatively? Mm-hmm. We want to revive manufacturing. We want to create jobs. We want to create these highly skilled jobs. How do we do it? Um, let's just try different things and make, you know, try and make use of networks and uh, try and create the right sort of image. Um, now, from a policy making point of view, I can see this isn't terribly attractive. Here's this chap, you know, whinging on, bleating about narratives in this incomprehensible way. But if we get it right, you know, it would be very, very successful. We spoke to Anne Pettifer this morning um, from the New Economics Foundation. One of the things that she said about the manufacturing sector is that um, there needs to be an alliance between the unions and the employers. Um, you, you know, she says that historically we are at loggerheads with each other and we, her argument was that we need to reclaim that part of the economy back from the financialization. Um, so, yeah, that, w- that was an interesting idea. And um, I, I'm not quite sure how it looks in practice, but, um, yeah... What, what? Well, I mean, what, I mean, I mean, one thing, for example, um, is is partly linked to the, the idea of union, which is, you know, now very, you know, concentrated in the public sector, where I mean, to be honest, they don't do the image of trade unions any favours. You know, they are often seen as being this deeply conservative, simply interested in their own uh, in their own welfare, not that of the broader um, of, of broader society. But we might think, for example, and there's some encouraging signs here, of you know, how do you encourage you know, different forms of corporate structure, you know, which might be more amenable to um, you know, working positively with unions. Um, you know, the current one, the shareholder one, um, it's been around for a long time, it's a dominant one. Um, but but you know, it's like evolutionary theory tells us that simply because something is dominant doesn't mean it's the best. So there are all sorts of different, I mean, one thing I find very encouraging is there's a lot of, you know, able, very able young people setting up things like uh, community interest companies mm-hmm. where it's run by a company, but there are limits on the dividends and limits yeah. on capital gains. It's got a community purpose. 
or you know maybe it's the time now to I mean cooperatives have been around for a long time haven't really taken off but it's more interesting well that, that, that is interesting and, and you know you're from an area which has a proud cooperative tradition and uh, in, in you know in, in other countries like Spain cooperatives like Mondragon play a really big part in the economy and I, I can see how um, that would be a really attractive model that, that we should probably be looking at a lot more in the UK. Um, the other thing that occurs to me is, is different working practices as well as, um, you know, as well as different corporate structures, um, sort of high intensity work practices where there is a lot more worker decision making um, that links to productivity. And I, I think it, it sounds to me that we all need to be a lot more creative about the kind of solutions that we, we, we look for instead of, as you say, just pulling the same levers that we've always pulled and hope that the results are more impressive next time around. Oh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, but I think, um, you know, I mean, as I say, it, it always comes off the objection, well, yes, but, you know, this, this might not work, this might fail, and it's true. You know, any single initiative might fail, but we've just got to think, you know, more imaginatively. Paul, I think that's, uh, that's, that's all I have, unless you have any other comments you'd like to make before we finish. Well, thanks for joining us, Paul. That was, that was really interesting. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.